So I finally saw Wrinkle in Time. I'll talk about my opinions on the film, whether it's as bad as everyone's saying at the end, but since it is marketed at least as science fiction, I'll first start with talking about some of the fun science stuff. So in Wrinkle in Time, we're traveling really far distances really fast, and how we're able to do that is we're told that if we were gonna travel from point A to point B via a straight line, it would take a really long time, but there's actually a faster way to travel than by a straight line. So we're able to take a shortcut and everything you've heard about the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, it's wrong. There's actually a faster way to travel. So is this scientific at all? There's an interesting parallel in mathematics. So there's three major Greek mathematicians. So there's Archimedes. He's famous because he said, give me a lever long enough, I can move the earth. He also died, very famous death. He's working on a math problem in the sand. A soldier comes over because there's a battle going on, stands in his way. And Archimedes says famous last words, do not disturb my circles. And soldier didn't really like that and stabbed Archimedes. And now it's a famous story, it may or may not be true. So there's Archimedes, we're not talking about him. There's Pythagoras. Now he's, everyone learns about him in school. He's the guy who came up with the, the formula for figuring out the, the lengths of a triangle. He was also very interested in the occult, numerology. We're not talking about him. This is the third guy. We don't talk about as much Euclid. Now Euclid He's a big geometry guy, so are the others, but he's kind of the geometry guy. He started to come up with these axioms, these truths about geometry, and he came up with all these different rules, and he proved them, and he came up with this one rule, very famous, the parallel postulate. Now, what's, why this is so famous is because it seems very intuitive, and it seems to make sense logically, but it's very, very hard to prove it. So what he came up with was the idea that if we have two lines, they're going out like this, and they're parallel lines, and they're extending, it seems obvious that these lines are always going to stay the same length apart. They're never going to converge and cross. They're never going to go out this way. If you just extend two lines, two lines straight out like that, they're always just going to stay the same distance. Now, most people think this is true. Intuitively, it makes a lot of sense, but it's very, very hard to prove. So if you accept that this is true and these lines are always going to stay the same distance, you have what's called Euclidean geometry. Now, this is basically just normal geometry. This is what everyone thinks about when they talk about geometry. If you, however, don't accept this intuitive truth, and instead you say, well, actually, no, these lines are going to start going like this, and it may take a long time, but eventually these lines are going are gonna to cross, then you have what's called Euclidean geometry. If you say, no, the lines are going to go like this for a really long time, but then they're going to start to and steadily go out more and more, you have hyperbolic geometry. Now, these geometries, these inspire a lot of artists. They're very, very visually fun to play with. And what's interesting about these geometries is truths in Euclidean geometry, like the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and hyperbolic or elliptical geometry, they're no longer true. So the question is, which kind of geometry is true? Which geometry describes the fundamental nature of reality? And it's unclear. People debate. Now, obviously, we perceive things, how we perceive ordinary day-to-day -day life. It's Euclidean. But maybe how we perceive things is not actually how the very fabric of existence is. So what words and concepts does Wrinkle in Time use to try to explain how this rapid travel between distances is impossible? The first is Tesseract. Now this is a word used in Marvel, this is a word used in Interstellar, the movie, and this is a word used in A Wrinkle in Time. So where it comes from, the actual mathematical concept of a Tesseract is basically a 4D cube. So what that means is you have a line that's one dimensional, you make a square, that's two-dimensional. You have a cube that's three-dimensional. Now, a cube is just a box. So a box of cereal, anything we find, you know, in nature, we, th we perceive it as three-dimensional. So you see cubes in nature. However, that's not how a cube actually exists in reality. In reality, it's a four-dimensional object because it also exists in time. So we're not able to see that fourth dimension. We're not able to perceive it. So what we perceive as a three-dimensional world, the world we actually live in is four-dimensional. So that begs the question, well, then why do we talk about cubes at all? If they don't really exist, if four-dimensional things exist, why don't we just talk about four-dimensional things? Why do we talk about lines, squares, cubes, when none of these things really exist? They're all just artificial creations in our mind. Short answer is, sometimes it's easier and more efficient to do calculations on, on cubes and lines and squares, but the real answer is, our brains, we can't, even the brightest among us, we can't really think in four dimensions and we can't really talk in four dimensions. So, but we do try. And a tesseract, this is one attempt of humans to try to think, well, that box of cereal, 
what's it like at some fundamental level? How does it actually exist? And a tesseract is an attempt to describe it as it actually exists, not just in space, but in time as well. And it is funny, in some way, tesseracts are the only thing that actually exists in the physical world. Lines certainly don't exist. You take a, a pencil, a paper clip, whatever thing that seems like a line that you try to find. No, it's a, it's a cube um, at some level. It has width, length, height but it also exists in time, so it's a tesseract. Even cubes don't exist, squares don't exist. They exist, you can represent them on a computer, you can get a representation of them, you could make a, a picture of them that we perceive as a cube or a square or a line, but lines don't really exist, tesseracts do. So again, it's funny, we talk about lines all the time, never talk about tesseracts, even though we probably should. So the terms tesseract and hypercube, sometimes they're used as synonyms. The subtle difference between them, when you talk about hyperspace, that just means anything that exists in larger, in more than three dimensions. So if you talk about a hyperplane, that's just a plane that exists in any kind of space that's more than three dimensions. So a hypercube, technically it's a cube that exists in four or more dimensions. So a cube existing in six dimensional space, that would also be a hypercube. A tesseract is just a cube that exists in specifically four dimensions. So that's a subtle difference. So I guess you could say a tesseract is a hypercube, but not all hypercubes are tesseracts. Okay, so that's what a tesseract is in math. Now, how does a wrinkle in time use this concept? What is a tesseract to a wrinkle in time? There's four possible, maybe five interpretations. So the first interpretation is that when you tesser, you focus and you use love or whatever you want to use and you are able to actually bend space-time to your will and actually create a fold in space-time that wasn't there before and then you call this fold that now exists a tesseract. Now, I don't think this is a correct interpretation because in the book, and I think to an extent in the movie, they talk about the fifth dimension and they also talk about things in ways that I think it's a little more complex than this. And also, if you look at the title, A Wrinkle in Time, it's not called Space Folds, it's not called A Wrinkle in Space, it's called A Wrinkle in Time, which seems to imply some kind of connection to the fourth dimension, which is time, and even higher dimensions. So that's why I think it's a different interpretation. Now, another interpretation is that these beings, the misses, they're higher dimensional beings. So they're able to travel how they travel is they're traveling in the fifth dimension. They exist in the fifth dimension, they're traveling in the fifth dimension, and the, the way the universe looks in that fifth dimension, the shape of the universe is a tesseract. So when they talk about a tesseract, they're talking about the fundamental shape of the universe, how it looks in five dimensions. So there's the idea that we as humans, three-dimensional beings, we see the universe and it looks like this. Now Earth is here, Kamazots, let's say, is way on the other side of the universe here. Now we travel in three dimensions, we perceive in three dimensions, but these higher dimensional beings, for them the universe is some kind of strange shape, no idea what it is, but it's a tesseract, and they perceive the universe like this. So Earth is here, and as you can see, most, th most things around the Earth are similar to how they were before, but Kamazots, which used to be way, way, way far away, right now because it's at, everything's been kind of folded on itself and it's a different shape, it's actually right nearby. So you can actually get to you can actually get to it pretty easily. So there's the interpretation that in higher dimensions, the shape of the universe, it's been folded. So now things that used to be really far apart in three dimensions, now they happen to be closer together. So you can travel to certain things, certain things in five dimensions really easily. And then there's the idea that maybe if they're truly interdimensional beings rather than just fifth dimensional beings, if they wanted to go to something that now in this new shape, the Tesseract, the Tesseract, they're not, they don't happen to, they want to travel to something, but now that something is kind of far away. It's even farther away than it was in three dimensions. Well, now they can go to dimension six. And in this, everything's folded different. It's an even different shape. So now maybe in dimension six, these two things they want to travel between, they happen to be closer together. Or there's the interpretation that the Tesseract is some kind of special shape where everything's closer together and everything's easier to get to. So really, it's not like there's an infinite number of dimensions and you can just keep going up and up. No, five dimensions, that's the, that's the spiritual plane. That's the spiritual level of dimensions and, and any kind of shape of the universe is at that shape is some kind of special shape where everything's easy to get to. And in the movie Interstellar, the Tesseract was used in relation to seeing all of time at once. So usually we're only able to see in the present. In Interstellar, the Tesseract was used to kind of conceptualize the past, present, and future and see them all at the same time. Now, you could use that analogy here and say that 
this fifth dimensional tesseract idea, it's not just it's not just a, any particular configuration or shape that it happened. These two things happen to be close together. No, the tesseract is a way of seeing all of space, all these different planets, in some way seeing them in it, represented very close together at a single point. So how does this relate to religion and spirituality? I think most deep religious thinkers, if you press them on it and said, well, what is hell, heaven or hell actually like? They would say, look, God, as an all-knowing being, the, the heaven or hell that they're able to come up with there's no way that us, as not mere mortals, as non-gods, we can't even conceptualize and we can't even think about what that would be like. So if we try to come up with what heaven would be like, an eternity of pizza, se sex, love, family, and Van Halen concerts. Now, maybe that would be good for a thousand years, let's say. A thousand years where every day it's pizza, listening to the same Van Halen songs, having sex... Spending time with family, yeah, that's pretty good for a thousand years even, let's say. And that's a long time. No one's ever tried to do anything <laughs> for that long. But let's say for a thousand years, that was pretty cool. After a million years, that's going to be indistinguishable from, from literal hell. You would, you would want to get out of that as much and say, please, I just, I can't take hearing this song again. So it shows how us with our limited minds, we can't come up with any kind of idea of heaven or hell. And we can't really understand eternity. And we can't really wrap our minds around around what's, what that re is really like. So if you completely take it away from the context of any particular religion and just look at it from a more secular standpoint, you could say, look, we're three-dimensional beings. Now, this is somewhat arbitrary. We know that there's at least one more dimension. There's at least one more dimension, but there could be many more dimensions. So you could say any kind of higher power, any kind of higher beings that would be responsible for any kind of heaven or hell they're not going to be three-dimensional beings. They're most likely going to be higher-dimensional beings who think in a higher dimension. So any kind of conception of eternity, eternal paradise, eternal hell that they come up with, it's going to be something that, that we who are limited by our arbitrary three-dimensional thinking, we're not going to be able to conceptualize it. So it's this idea that you're not going to recognize heaven when you get there. It's going to be something that you know, us, in, in this life at least, we're limited by our three-dimensional thinking, and whatever we experience, if, if there is an afterlife, whatever we experience there, it's going to be nothing that, that anyone, even the smartest of us, even, even in a hundred years when we're all lovers of science and we all spend all our time thinking about these kind of things, no, it's going to be something that even then no one's going to come up with, with just what a higher dimensional being would come up with as paradise. Now I'm actually going to end the video there. I know I think I said at the beginning of the video that I would talk about whether or not I liked the movie at the end. I'm really sorry if you hated all that abstract stuff and didn't want to listen to it and we're just sticking with it. I doubt you stuck through it all the way to, to get to the end. Maybe you clicked through with your skimmer and, and uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry if you clicked through for nothing, but I, I might make another video talking about whether or not I liked the movie. Um, I, I didn't, I guess, I guess I'll just say that, but, but yeah, I want to, I want to kind of be measured in, in what I say about it. And uh, I don't want to attack it on at the end when I might, uh, might say something, might say something incorrectly and, and have everyone jump down my throat. So um, yeah, but I, I hope the science stuff was cool.